still I could not turn, nor retrace one step. God must have led me on. As to my own will or conscience, impassioned grief had trampled one and stifled the other. I was weeping wildly as I walked along my solitary way. Fast, fast I went like one delirious. A weakness, beginning inwardly, extending to the limbs, seized me, and I fell. I lay on the ground some minutes, pressing my face to the wet turf. I had some fear, or hope, that here I should die. But I was soon up, crawling forwards on my hands and knees. Jane Eyre, written by Charlotte Bronte and published in 1847, is still regarded as one of the great books of the literary canon and has garnered many screen adaptations, three of which were played in the introduction to this video. The scene which I am drawing takes place just after Jane's hopes of marrying Mr Rochester have fallen apart due to the discovery of his hidden mad wife in the attic of Thornfield Hall. While she still loves Rochester, Jane does not listen to his pleas for her to stay and elope with him, and knows that she must vacate Thornfield. Devastated, Jane trudges along the moor, trying to escape Rochester and find somewhere he has no connections and cannot find her. Taking inspiration from the artist St. Marlow Loon, who creates story-like illustrations often with text or writing, I included a quote from chapter 27 of Jane Eyre. I was weeping wildly as I walked along my solitary way. Fast, fast I went like one delirious. The scene highlights Jane's independence and morality, since she is not content to live with Mr. Rochester as his mistress. It also represents a new start for Jane, since she has left most of her possessions behind at Thornfield. I'm using gouache and a Canson sketchbook to create my piece, which takes reference from a photo from the 2006 TV version of Jane Eyre. To fit in with the moody atmosphere, I used muted colours in her clothes and in the background. We see Jane tired and delirious from her walk through the moors, emotionally exhausted. Bertha Mason, Rochester's mad wife, is her double throughout the book and is also seen to look tired, ragged and emotional, with her hair flowing free. In this scene, this could represent Jane's inner soul releasing upon her escape from Thornfield. I drew birds along the frame of the painting. The bird motif is used throughout the novel, with one famous quote being, I am no bird and no net ensnares me. It seems to represent Jane and freedom, and in this chapter, is reference in relation to love. I actually found this painting pretty tough to do. Whenever I start out with a sketch I really like, I know that my painting won't end up quite as nice. This happens also vice versa. If I start out with a sketch I don't like, I tend to prefer the final painting of it. Later on, I ended up redoing the face, so I thought it was a little bit improved. In terms of my technique, I used a orange pencil just to do a light sketch. And when I started with the gouache, I did watercolour-like washes to establish the colours and tones. And then my method for gouache painting is normally just taking a while just to build everything up and keep adding colours and keep adding tones. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. Later on, I also added a dark bluish grey background, which was the frame, and then added some bird and leaves and twig motifs. And we'll finish with the full passage at the end of chapter 27 from Jane Eyre.
birds were faithful to their mates, birds were emblems of love. What was I? In the midst of my pain of heart and frantic effort of principle, I abhorred myself. I had no solace from self-approbation, none even from self-respect. I had injured, wounded, left my master. I was hateful in my own eyes. Still I could not turn, nor retrace one step. God must have led me on. As to my own will or conscience, impassioned grief had trampled one and stifled the other. I was weeping wildly as I walked along my solitary way. Fast, fast I went like one delirious. A weakness, beginning inwardly, extending to the limbs, seized me, and I fell. I lay on the ground some minutes, pressing my face to the wet turf. I had some fear, or hope, that here I should die. But I was soon up, crawling forwards on my hands and knees, and then again raised to my feet, as eager and as determined as ever to reach the road. When I got there, I was forced to sit to rest me under a hedge, and while I sat, I heard wheels and saw a coach come on. I stood up and lifted my hand. It stopped. I asked where it was going. The driver named a place a long way off, where I was sure Mr. Rochester had no connections. I asked for what sum he would take me there. He said thirty shillings. I answered I had but twenty. Well, he would try to make it do. He further gave me leave to get into the inside, as the vehicle was empty. I entered, was shut in, and it rolled on its way. Gentle reader, may you never feel what I then felt. May your eyes never shed such stormy, scalding, heart-wrung tears as poured from mine. May you never appeal to heaven in prayers so hopeless and so agonized as in that hour left my lips. For never may you, like me, dread to be the instrument of evil to what you wholly love.